suspects are being one case involves the DC FBI is now offering a hundred thousand dollars to see for the police are releasing marathon. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a paranormal and true crime podcast. So out of fact, I'm going to be telling you a mini story about a spirit who helped her mother solve her own murder. Zona Shrew was a woman from West Virginia. In 1897, just three months after she had married her husband, she passed away in what looked like a fall down the stairs. Shortly after her death, she appeared to her mother to let her know that her husband had killed her and her death was not an accident. When her mother first went to the police with her story, they thought she was making it up and brushed it off until she convinced an investigator she was telling the truth. Zona's body was exhumed, where they found bruises all over her body and a broken neck. Her husband had killed her and put her in a stiff collar dress and staged her death. Her husband was believed until her body was exhumed. Her husband was arrested and convicted for her murder. This episode, I'm going to be going into part two of the Velisca Axe murder, the haunting of the home. If you haven't already, I'd like to give you a chance to go back and listen to the first part where I talk more in depth about the crime. In 2014, Robert Larson was investigating the home of the Moore family where the Velisca Axe murders took place in 1912. Alongside the investigation were Robert's parents. Robert wanted to recreate the events that took place in the home on the night of June 9, 1912, that took the lives of eight people, two adults, and six children. Robert had his parents monitor the Velisca Axe murder home from the outside while he staged the home inside. He set up the home to make it look like it did the morning the victims were found. Down to the details of the mirrors being covered, windows covered, a slab of bacon, and a bowl of bloody water on the table. Robert went to the bedroom the Stillinger girls were attacked and killed in. He laid on the bed, holding a knife in his right hand. He started to provoke the spirit of the murderer. He called the spirit names and yelled insults. A ball of light came from the closet, going straight at him when he lost consciousness. He woke to his parents calling for help, and a knife plunged into his right shoulder. He survived the accident, but swears it wasn't an accident. Robert is right-handed, and the knife went into his right shoulder. He says the knife was put in a position he wouldn't be able to do himself, but the police report it differently, marking his accident as self-inflicted. The only ones who will ever truly know what happened will be Robert and his parents. The camera used in the investigation was in a position that didn't pick up the attack. The recorder that Robert used picked up the whole accident, but after listening and being so disturbed by what they heard, his parents deleted the recording. Amy Bruni, a paranormal investigator, host of the podcast Haunted Road, and seen on shows like Ghost Hunters, interviewed Robert Larson for a show she was on named Kindred Spirit. She recalled the meeting, saying what happened that night changed him. It was probably one of the most powerful interviews I have ever conducted with someone. It was probably one of the first times I met someone who had a paranormal encounter that made me question whether paranormal activity can truly be dangerous because I had never heard a story like this. The look in his eyes was complete and utter terror. Robert isn't the only person who had events in this home terrify him. Before the home was owned by the Lynns, 13 other owners had called this home their own. Many owners rented the home out to tenants. The first couple to move in after the death of the family were first to experience paranormal activity in the home. The new owners would wake up to a shadow of a man with an axe standing over their beds and hearing whispers of children at their bed. When the owner told her husband what she had been experiencing, he stayed up all night to watch over her. After having his own experience that night of children laughing around him, he went into town to find out about the home. In town, he ran into a friend who was one of the people who walked through the home the day the victims were found. He had a box that he used to keep the items he found that day. In the box was a piece of Josiah Moore, one of the victims' skull. The owner immediately left that day. The next family to live there, the next family that lived in the home, after these owners, had a family member who wouldn't even sleep in the home. The grandfather who lived with the family built a shed outside in the backyard that he would sleep in rather than in the home. The family also found themselves having problems with the front door. At first, the front door randomly opened during the night, but turned to the door opening itself so often the family would have to get up multiple times to close the door. Even while locked or blocked off, the front door would open. 
Eventually, the family would move out so annoyed with the issues they had in the home from what they believed was the spirits in the home. In the 1960s, a family moved in that consisted of two daughters and multiple sons who often spent time alone in the home while their parents worked outside of town. The girls would regularly have paranormal encounters. At night, they would hear screaming and crying of children, drawers opening, and when no one was in the room, getting locked in the rooms. The parents of the girls never believed them when they told their stories and what happened to them in the home. Till one night when a violent encounter happened, the father was home from work, sharpening his pocket knives when he seemed to black out and wake up stabbed by his own pocket knife. The father doesn't remember how it happened, but like Robert Larson, felt a spirit had something to do with it. His daughters saw the events differently. Both of his daughters interviewed on the show Ghost Avengers when they investigated the home. Linda, one of the daughters, during the interview, says her father was sharpening the knife away from him, as he always did when it seemed a force pushed the knife up and into his hand. After retelling the story, while standing in the home, Linda had to sit down. She felt lightheaded and visibly shaking. Residents of the home, over time, built up a collection of encounters that checks almost every mark in the paranormal encounter book. From hearing things such as children crying, laughing, and screaming, footsteps walking around the home, especially in the attic, seeing things such as men standing over the bed with an axe, drawers opening by themselves, and doors opening by themselves, even experiencing darker spirits who would scratch them, hold them down, and push them away from windows they would look out of. In 1994, the new owners of the home, Darwin and Martha Lynn, began the process of turning the home back to its original design using the pictures from 1912. Construction done to the home included vinyl siding taken off the home, and the original wood restored and painted, removal of extensions to the home, removal of plumbing and electricity, features in the home, the addition of a chicken coop and an outhouse in the backyard, Using photos and testimony from grand jury, the Lynns tried to match the exact layout and furniture that the Moores had when they lived in the home. In 1998, the home was added to the National Register of Historical Places and made into a museum. The museum offers daytime tours and overnight tours, stays, and investigations. Daytime tours are between 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. for $10. An overnight tour starts at 4 a.m. with a tour and ends at 9.30 a.m. A deposit of $200 is required as you make your reservation and totals to $428 in total. Johnny Hauser, the Valencia Axe Murder Homes caretaker, reports that many older ladies or group of friends who love true crime or paranormal stay overnight at the home. He lives just next door in what used to be the home of Mary Peckham, the neighbor who first noticed something was wrong with the Moore family. He says he loves to see the friends who go there for their bucket list, for those who bring kids as it helps bring life back into the home. The home not only sees friends and families, but sees a lot of paranormal investigators. Shows such as Ghost Adventures, Kinder Spirits, The Dead Files, and many smaller paranormal investigation groups have investigated the home. Paranormal investigators catch many EVPs in the home, play ball with the spirits, watch doors open by themselves, and play the flashlight game with the spirits. The APRA, the American Paranormal Research Society, caught an EVP while investigating the home in 2010 from the more children's shared room where they were attacked. On the EVP, you can hear small children saying no, followed by laughter. The child then says, please no, what are you doing to me? EVPs aren't the only thing caught in the more children's room. Investigators will bring a ball to the room and it will roll by itself. Many videos can be seen where the ball is on one side of the room and rolls to the other side of the room or even outside the room at points. In the video, the investigators will drop next to the ball and attempt to move it, but it will not move for them, but will move on its own. In the room, there is also a closet with claims that it opens and closes by itself. In one video, a female investigator asked if anyone wanted to play. The door would crack open, but when she ignored it, the door would close again. This went on for 10 minutes, all captured on a video. Others have very similar events, but videos of people touring the home pointed out a window right across from where the door was that brings in a breeze 
and even a vent very close to the door. Another video from an investigation shows an investigator who got possessed. He was laughing and smiling when no one was talking to him. When a fellow investigator asked, why doesn't the demon leave the home? The possessed investigator replied, we can't. An orb then shot out of his mouth. One paranormal investigation group collected over 20 EVPs in the first hour of investigating the home, ranging from screams, laughs, and even intelligent responses. The Villisca Axe Murder House has brought in tons of tourism for the town of Villisca, Iowa, and even TV show crews, rather they be there to show respect for the family, learn about the crime, or investigate the home. We know that many people find evidence at this home. In any place that sees a crime like the one committed against the Moore family and the Stilligen girls, or even as many people from all over the world that have been there, has some type of energy from not only the event, the events that took place, but the people who bring the energy in. We may never be able to firmly say if it is haunted, but what we do know about the home is the unsolved crime that took place taking eight people's lives. It's important to remember who they were amongst the haunting of the home. Have you heard of Anchor? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. When I started Misty Mysteries, I didn't know where to go, and Anchor helped me get Misty Mysteries started without charging me an arm and a leg. Anchor is really my suggestion for anyone looking to start a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit in app or on the website. Anchor distributes your podcast on all the listening places such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, and all your favorite listening places. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place and best of all it's totally free on anchor fm and on the anchor app thank you for listening to misty mysteries if you like the podcast please share it with friends family and on social media speaking of social media you can find the podcast on places like twitter instagram and facebook please leave a good review for the podcast on places like apple podcasts and pod chasers if you'd like to support and help the podcast further, you can find it on Buy Me a Coffee, where you can do a one-time donation for a shout-out on the podcast. Any donation of $5 or more not only comes with a shout-out, but comes with a set of Misty Mystery stickers, a handwritten thank you note from me. You can find the podcast on listening places such as Spotify, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Google Podcasts, and so many more. And I'll see you on Wednesday.